Please, colleagues, uh, we should start as soon as possible to make sure that we will accommodate uh, as many questions as possible. So please uh, get seated. I would kindly ask the press to allow us to open the meeting. Thank you. So, dear colleagues, let me open point number five of agenda. Once more, please accept apology for Mr. Gultier in not being here. So, I was uh, asked yesterday to chair this uh, important meeting, the meeting that is very special because it doesn't take uh, too often, I must say. So, I am extremely pleased to welcome here Madame Christine Lagarde that is candidate for the position of President of European Central Bank. As we know, the ECB President Mario Draghi will leave his function on 31st of October after a term in the office uh, of five years. In accordance with the Article 283.2 of the Treaty uh, on the Functioning of European Union, the European Parliament is consulted in the Council's recommendation on the appointment of President of European Central Bank. Ahead of the, today's public he hearing, the candidate received a written questions of a number of 76 questions. The replies by the candidates are annexed to the draft report of the appointment of ECB president. The hearing today will be followed by important vote at 6 uh, p.m. today. The Econ Committee will then submit a proposal for the European Parliament decision on the Council recommendation regarding Madame Lagarde nominations as a candidate for the, for the position of President of European Central Bank at the plenary sitting of 16 to 19 September. At the beginning of the hearing, the candidate will make a brief introduction statement of 10 minutes followed by the question and answer session. We have very extensive list of uh, MPs who wants to ask the question and my will is to accommodate two or three KHDI at the end. So please stick to your time. I will also kindly ask uh, Madame Lagarde to stick the time. And please be realistic. Uh, if you are asking uh, the question, consider if you can get really good reply within the five minutes. But without any delay, let me now pass the floor to Madame Lagarde for up to 10 minutes. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I would begin by asking for your indulgence because I was actually um, offered to prepare an intervention of 15 minutes. And when discussing that with President Galtieri yesterday, it was agreed that I could speak for 15. But if you want me to stop at 10, I'll stop at 10, whatever. Monsieur le Président, Mesdames et Messieurs. Uh, chairman, ladies and gentlemen, uh, members of the committee. Here before you, and I'm actually very intimidated to appear before you. The only consolation I find is that many of you in this room probably find themselves in the same positions as I am. You're joining, I'm a candidate, you're learning, I'm learning as well. And we come with all the goodwill, the determination, and the enthusiasm for the cause that we are prepared to serve. I believe that the relationship between the European Parliament and the ECB is a cornerstone of our monetary union. Central bankers are independent, but they're not directly elected. And as a result, that can only be justified if they are held accountable vis-a-vis -vis those representatives that are elected. I therefore consider the opinion of the European Parliament as a key step in my appointment process. Now, when presenting to you this morning, I hesitated between giving you a European economic outlook or giving you a technical discussion about various matters of monetary policy and other matters. But I resolved that it might be more interesting to actually highlight some aspects of my professional experience and background, which I consider relevant to the tasks of ECB president. I have been the managing director of the International Monetary Fund for the last eight years and I've had the privilege to head an institution that is the core of the global financial safety net 
and whose governors are themselves central banks. In that capacity, and also as Finance Minister for France, I have contributed to enhancing the crisis resolution tools and the financial regulations on both the European level and the international level. I have also been directly involved in strengthening the European and Monetary Union. Now, what has driven me in conducting those tasks is certainly the determination that it is worth all the while to actually serve public interest and to deliver on the justified expectations of the people. I was sadly made aware of the critical impact that some lack of regulation or lack of decisions can have on the people. And I was also mindful of the profound impact that decisions of public institutions can have on people's lives. In my positions in previous life, I've always tried to focus on what are regarded as fundamental issues. At the IMF, contrary to all expectations, it meant focusing also on rising inequalities, focusing also on climate change, focusing also on promoting fairer and more inclusive growth. These were not necessarily regarded as macro-critical by that institution, which mandate was to focus on macro-critical matters, but eventually it became regarded as macro-critical, and I'm glad that I insisted on those. But good leadership is not just about setting priorities. It is also about listening to all voices. Not just experts' voices, but all voices. And fostering diversity of thought. At the IMF, I, of course, worked very closely with top-notch economists. In order for them to produce evidence-based and data-led decisions. And I listened carefully to staff to develop a common and modern vision of the IMF work. Making the IMF more inclusive, enhancing its diversity and opening it to civil society were central to my strategy. Why do I say all that? Because it is those same value that I believe in that I would promote if I was confirmed as ECB president. And in my remarks today, what I would like to focus is on three of those principles that I regard as critically relevant for the purpose of the task. The first two that I will handle together is commitment, commitment to the ECB mandate as laid out in the treaty. The second is agility in responding to the new challenges. I will handle these two together. The third one, which to me is critically important as well, is inclusiveness. And I will explain how I understand inclusiveness in that respect. So commitment and agility. We know for, and have known for decades of theory and practice, that a clear mandate for monetary policy and the central bank's commitment to pursue it are vital for stability and welfare. And since its inception, the ECB has demonstrated a steadfast commitment to that goal. In its early years, it achieved the remarkable feat of steering a diverse monetary in union in a regime of low and stable inflation. But then it faced an abrupt change in 2008, when it had to fight not inflation, but deflation. Again, the commitment was crucial this time to ensure that price stability was not jeopardized by a long period of what I have termed lowflation. In doing so, the ECB had to adjust to the new challenges that it faced at the time. It had to reappraise prior convictions in the light of evidence and experience, and to be innovative in its policy toolkit within the boundaries set by the law and in accordance with the mandate. And it was this agility that allowed the central bank to continue delivering in rapidly changing circumstances. Without that, without that ability to innovate at the time, the crisis would certainly, in my view, and in the view of most experts that look at it seriously, would have been a lot worse. In fact, 
the ECB itself did some research into that to assess what would have happened had it not been innovative, had it not resp responded with agility and concluded that the economy would have been 2% smaller if it had not entered into unconventional measures since mid-2014. Which is not to say that before 2014 there was no such unconventional measures as well. Employment in the euro area also increased by over 11 million, 11 million new jobs since the trial of 2013, as those measures boosted confidence in the economic recovery and encouraged job creation. So if confirmed as president, I would draw on the same sound principles, sticking to the commitment that is embedded in the mandate, but using the agility to adapt to the world as it changes around us. The challenges that were in the ECB's current policy have not disappeared. The euro area economy faces some near-term risks, mainly related to external factors, we can discuss that, and inflation remains persistently too low and certainly below the objective. I therefore agree with the view of the Governing Council that a highly accommodative policy is warranted for a prolonged period of time in order to bring inflation back to the famous below but close to 2%. But there are also some important questions on the horizon that monetary policy will need to address. First, though the impact of unconventional policies continue to be net positive, we need to be mindful of the negative effects and the potential side effects of those policies, and we have to take the concerns of the people into account. While remaining committed to our price stability mandate, this requires continuous monitoring and a very careful cost-benefit analysis as is conducted currently by the Governing Council. Second, the global environment of low inflation and low interest rates poses strategic questions for all central banks. It's not just the ECB. The central banks need to enhance their understanding of inflation dynamics, take stock of new instruments activated to contain the crisis, including the use of balance sheets and unconventional monetary policies. And they need to reflect on whether their monetary policy frameworks are sufficient and sufficiently robust to future challenges. This is a task that I intend to embark upon and to join if organized on a broader basis. Third, central banks are increasingly facing new types of challenges, not least related to climate change, to the disruptive impact of technological change, to the potential fragmentation of the current multilateral order. And here I see it as crucial that monetary policy is forward-looking and considers the broader con context in which price stability, its mandate, is achieved. Ultimately, the effectiveness of our monetary policy hinges on the resilience of the financial system. The ECB's role in financial stability has expanded significantly in response to the challenges that emerged during the crisis. It has been asked to embrace uh, new responsibilities for macroprudential policy and to host the new European banking supervisor, whom I understand you heard just before me. Supervision has done an effective job in strengthening capital buffers and reducing risks on balance uh, sheets of banks. Common equity tier one ratios have risen from 11% at the end of 2014 to now 14% in 2018. The stock of non-performing loans, more work to be done I hear, of most significant banks has now halved in that period of time. But a series of challenges remain. Both banking union and capital market union need to be completed to foster deeper risk sharing in the euro area and expand access to finance. Bank profitability, you've heard it, is low. And the landscape of the financial sector is being changed by the growing role of non-banks in intermediation and technological transformation. The share of non-bank financing flows 
to euro area firms has risen from around 30% before the crisis to more than 50% today. Those are big changes. They need to be considered when in having in mind financial stability. Fintech firms now receive around a quarter of the financial service industry's venture and startup funding. Again, big changes underway. And in this environment, central banks and supervisors need to ensure the safety of the financial sector, but also to open up to opportunities that are procured by those changes. And that means being alert to risks in terms of financial stability, privacy, criminal activities, and ensuring appropriate regulation is in place to steer technologies towards the public good. But it also means recognizing the wider social benefits from innovation and allowing them space to develop in an environment that is safe for financial stability purposes. So, commitment to the mandate, agility to adjust. The third component, which in my view is clearly important, is inclusiveness. And let me tell you what I mean by inclusiveness. The first aspect of inclusiveness in my mind is cooperation. Within the Euro system, there is a huge wealth of expertise that we can draw on to prepare for the future and strengthen our capacity to tackle common challenges. One example of that is the Network for Greening the Financial System, which was launched a few years ago, not long ago, 2017 if I recall, by a few central bank governors and which the ECB is now a member. Changes will have to take place. Central banks can also play a key role in sustaining global cooperation, thereby helping to underpin the multilateral order in the field where it has competence. This multilateral order is under threat at the moment. Central banks have to close ranks and deliver on that multilateral order. But central banks do not act in a vacuum. The effectiveness of monetary policy can be enhanced by appropriate national and European policies and by the trust of the public. So I see a possibility for deeper cooperation in other areas as well. Completing the single market remains one of the most powerful tools we have to spread new technologies and raise productivity, while also safeguarding consumers and protecting labor standards by avoiding or limiting the social dumping. This holds true for the real economy and especially in the area of services, but also in the financial sector, which I already touched upon. The role of the parliament here is instrumental as a co-legislator. Another area of cooperation is fiscal policies, which need to be available to stabilize our economies through downturns and avoid overburdening monetary policy. I was a finance minister for four years at the time of the financial crisis, and I have witnessed the difficulties of coordinating policies, particularly in fiscal matters. Because we are focused on our national issues, we tend to go home And yet, the European dimension can be critical if properly completed in order to resist destabilization caused by external shocks. It has to be effective, it has to be simplified, and this is not something that I invent off the cuff. The IMF has actually done a lot of work in relation to effectiveness and simplifications of the rules that preside over a strengthening and deepening of the markets. In the short term, concluding the reform of the European Stability Mechanism, operationalizing the backstop of the Single Resolution Fund, and establishing a scalable budgetary instrument for competitiveness and convergence would be useful steps forward, but forward. In combination with other reforms to the financial and payment systems, these measures would also help reinforce the international role of the euro. That would afford the euro area more of the benefits of issuing an international reserve currency and a greater degree of strategic independence in an increasingly uncertain world. Second final dimension to me, critically important, is diversity. I'm always mindful of something that Paul Valéry said after the end of the Second World War. Mettons en commun ce que nous avons de meilleur et enrichissons. Let us work together and look from the Euro European Parliament didn't say anything different. And I'm t also convinced that diversity is a source of wealth.
drawing on all talents from all backgrounds and committing absolutely to all people being treated equally, be that on the basis of gender, of race, of nationality, of background. But it also means speaking and listening to a wide range of voices, as wide a range as possible, and making sure that dialogue is a central part of policymaking. And it is in that respect that I very much welcome the dialogue that we will have over the course of the next few years if I was confirmed. The ECB needs to listen to and understand markets. Need not be guided by market, but it certainly needs to listen and understand. But it also needs to listen and understand the people. Because a currency is, after all, a public good that belongs to the people. When at the IMF, I certainly worked really hard to make sure that civil society representatives were included in the process of our deliberations. And I would certainly hope that we can work hard at making sure that civil society representatives and people actually take ownership of what is currently regarded very highly by the people of the euro area, the euro. Unfortunately, we cannot say the same about all the European institutions, but I believe that it is through fostering a strong and vibrant dialogue that we can actually improve that situation. So, to deliver on commitment, agility and inclusiveness, I believe that innovation and cooperation will be required as much as accountability and communication. I very much look forward to a fruitful exchange with you, and I'm here not only to answer your questions. I prepared hard, but I come with what I have and the experience that I have acquired over the course of time, but I'm also here very much to listen to your views and to appreciate what you expect from a European Central Bank President. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Madam. I guess it was important to hear all your message, but we have to adjust our timetable accordingly. So in the first round, it's really up to five minutes, is the answer, up to five minutes, and then we will adjust the following round uh, according to time schedule. The first one, Marcus Ferber on behalf of EPP. Yeah, vielen Dank. Yes, uh, thank you very much. If you uh, don't mind, I'll do this in uh, German. I'd like to uh, welcome you on behalf of the EPP group um, and in your uh, acting uh, role. And uh, we've spoken with you many times before. Now you have uh, set out what the uh, challenges are. And I want to come back to the ECB uh, mandate because uh, I'm sure there are other things which will need to be decided. Uh, but these are not the role of the central bank. Now, you said that we have to uh, use the new innovative instruments, and I was very interested uh, to uh, see um, studies from the IMF, uh, which were published uh, during your period in office, saying that uh, cash should be eliminated, that uh, uh, negative interest should be dealt with uh, uh, d d differently, and also uh, talked about uh, uh, helicopter money. Uh, that would be one of the options. And so my specific question is, which of these options is it that you're thinking of when you say that we need to work with new innovative instruments in order to be able to complete the mandate of the ECB? Well, thank you very much for the question. Um, you know, I think in uh, 2008 and then subsequently in 2014, uh, very few people would have expected uh, the kind of tools that were used, some of them invented, uh, by the various central bank governors from around the world. Whether it was forward guidance, whether it was the use of macroprudential uh, tools in micro or macro uh, dimensions, whether it was the uh, uh, programs of purchases of different instruments, whether it was the LITRO, the uh, targeted um, re uh, financing mechanisms, I don't think anybody at the time in this institution, probably uh, in, in other places, including central banks, would have expected that they would have to resort to those tools. So there was a lot of work that was done in response uh, to the demands of the time. And clearly, there was a, a focus by, this by the ECB on actually delivering on Article 127 of the uh, uh, TFUE, 
which focuses primarily uh, on price stability. And it is with price stability in mind that they deployed uh, a set of tools that were then used um, to good effect throughout the euro area. To good effect because, and it's, it's always hard with counterfactual, because you have to sort of model back and determine what would have happened had they not used those tools. But the work was done, both at the ECB, and we did that at the IMF as well, to try to appreciate the value of those tools. And it's clear that it moved away from the risk of deflation. And it's clear that it helped grow the European, the Euro area economic zone. 2% is the number that uh, the ECB arrived at. And it's also true that multiple jobs were created as a result of uh, this renewed confidence. Now, looking forward, we have to do exactly what was done at the time. What are the threats? What are the circumstances? What will be the most appropriateness of tools, the existing ones, with the amplitude that is still left to be used eventually? What is the cost-benefit analysis of using those tools and to what extent? And those are clearly um, areas, assessments, and decisions that will have to be made in a collegial way by the governing council. I don't want uh, to prejudge on what the governing council will do on September 12 or its subsequent council. It's not for me to say, because I'm possibly incoming, and I'm not the person who can actually uh, determine anything at this point in time. My strong belief is that the cost-benefit analysis and possibly a review of the monetary framework that would have to be conducted not just by the ECB, but also in coordination with other uh, central bank institutions from around the world, is warranted, given the circumstances. Thank you very much. Uh, first, SMB speaker, Jonas Fernandez. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Welcome, Ms. Lagarde, to this committee. And I am afraid that my prepared question is very similar with the Ferber's uh, question, Sorry about but, that. but maybe in the other, in the other sense. <laughs> <That's what laughs> and, <I thought. laughs> and you written uh, replies to this committee, <clears throat> there is an answer, and I would like you to clarify. In the question number six, about the opportunity to promote or no a revision of the ECB's monetary policy framework, you refresh on the changes that have happened since the beginning of the crisis, but don't offer a clear, affirmative, or negative answer. The current framework dates from 2003, sometimes before the start of the financial crisis and the use by the ECB of unconventional measures. Since then, the natural or the equilibrium interest rate has been reduced which derived from condition and factor resulting from secular stagnation, while lower bond constraints monetary policy. So I agree with Ferber that we will have to increase the natural or the equilibrium interest rate, but the natural, not the nominal interest rate. In these circumstances, it will be worthwhile to reanalyze the conceptual framework of monetary policy, of course, within the ECB mandate, to study the option for increasing the natural interest rate, which in turn will allow to ECB to expand the tools it uses and its scope of intervention in the face of a future crisis, such as a clarify of the inflation target and its asymmetry, set an objective of prices level, or the study of the introduction of digital money, among others. Will you support and push for a review of the ECB's monetary framework as Bank of Canada or Federal Reserve as doing now? And please, can you be more concrete that in your written answer? Thank you so much. But I tried really hard in my written answer to be as um, exhaustive and sometimes overly technical on some, in some respects. But to come back to, you, to your particular question, 2003 is a long time ago, and many things have changed since 2003. That's as far as the ECB is concerned. If we look at other central banks, highly respected and reputable, 
the Bank of Canada does a review of its monetary framework every five years. The Fed has embarked in a review of its monetary framework, uh, which you know, started about six months ago or so, and is intended to last for about 12 months in order to canvas all the voices and uh, take stock of all views uh, in relation to that framework. I believe that under the current presidency of uh, President Draghi, there is already elements of re-exploring or examining some of the components of the monetary framework. I think in particular uh, that the points that, was made, that were made uh, back in July in order to determine whether inflation uh, at close to but below 2% should be attained from below or should be attained in a, a symmetric way uh, is already a way to review elements of the uh, monetary um, policy framework. I think the clarification of the aim is also something that has already been a little bit uh, explored, uh, not in saying exactly what the aim is, you know, what, what is the meaning of close to but below 2%? Are we talking about 1.6? Are we talking about 1.9? There is clearly, you know, flexibility in between. And my understanding of what the ECB governing council is, is now saying, or certainly the president, is that it is not the 1.6. It doesn't say exactly what it is. I think that you know, all those who have been in central banking appreciate the subtlety of all that. Not everybody does. And actually, as was mentioned by the, uh, uh, I think it was the central bank governor of Australia at Jackson Hole, where all central bank governors get together. He said something like, would anybody on the street understand why we're spending so much time on trying to define the close to, but not more than 2%. So I think that we need to, number one, clarify, explore, take stock of views, and assess the impact and determine whether on a cost-benefit basis we need to better clarify the framework. So I would certainly uh, be encouraging that movement, which obviously will have governing council uh, review in order to be decided. Thank you. Now, Louis Garicano on behalf of Renew. Uh, Madame Lagarde, is, uh, I, let me tell you personally, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to see a woman of your experience and ability uh, being nominated to this, to this job, so, so good luck with it. Um, we, we are we're living in, in really scary times. Uh, it, it really does feel like <coughs> the, the, the populism, the trade war that, that, that has been initiated by, by Mr. Trump and other shocks to the global economy can really lead us to a new recession. And, and what, what I'm personally worried about, many European citizens are worried, is whether the Eurozone and the European Central Bank are, are prepared for that. On the, on the European Central Bank, um, your predecessors have basically exhausted or come close to exhausting the uh, conventional and conventional measures that can be used to fight, uh, to, to restart the economy. And it doesn't seem like there is much more scope uh, for lower interest rates or for much lower interest rates for, for unconventional monetary policy. Many people are wondering whether there's much more scope. For recently, Larry Summers uh, pointed that out in a, in a recent article. Um, on, the European, on the Eurozone side, uh, we haven't really done fully our homework. There are a lot of structural things that haven't happened and reforms that haven't happened and that need to happen. Potentially, it is we don't have a fiscal a tool to stabilize the economy. There are, there are many things that haven't happened. So my questions are two in those two areas. First, is your sense that the European Central Bank has the tools uh, necessary to fight a potential new recession? Um, what are those tools? What's your reading of the tools that have been used in the past? What new tools need to be used? And second, the Eurozone, does it have, uh, has it done its homework? Are there reforms that are needed undertaken? And if not, what are your, your priorities? What are the things that you would see this, like to see this Parliament, the Council, the Commission actually undertake? And what's going to be your, your role? How do you see your role in trying to push for those things, whether it's deposit insurance, whether it's a Eurozone budget, whether it is a backstop for the uh, rescue mechanism, etc. Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much, and thank you for your uh, opening comments. Um, you know, I remember back in the crisis times, many central bankers uh, complaining, using the formula, central banks are not the only game in town. And I think in many ways, uh, we are still at a time when central bank governors, uh, while using all the tools in their toolbox, while re-examining monetary framework uh, where necessary, while um, focusing and fine-tuning the tools available, and they should do that job in accordance with their mandate. There is clearly cooperation to be had if all the institutions in Europe and in the Eurozone in particular want to respond to the threat of populism and nationalism. And with that, I have in mind an area where maybe I will not venture when, if I become president of the ECB. And it has to do with the fiscal role that many countries can actually play. It has been the case, and you know, I've said that as managing director of the IMF, that some countries in the euro area can actually use some of their fiscal space in order to improve broadband infrastructure and uh, set in place the public spending that will actually help fight the recession. I think that there are more countries in that situation nowadays. When you look at the list of euro area countries and those that are virtually at, at zero deficit or within 0.5% of, of deficit, it's, all, it's a majority of countries in the euro area. So certainly there is not a lot of room, but there is room that can be used uh, in terms of fiscal policies. Second, structural reforms uh, are in many, many countries um, mission unfinished. Some of them have started, uh, some of them have uh, reluctantly looked at them but not done much, and clearly those countries that do not have the fiscal space today, and it's less than half of the euro area countries, they need to really engineer their fiscal uh, mix with a growth-friendly focus and use the arm of structural reforms now as we have some growth, because that's, those are the circumstances when structural reforms can be most effective and can actually deliver better results. So it's really the mix of the three, of the, mon the adequate monetary policy deploying all the tools it has, the fiscal policies expansionary for those countries that can afford it and that need it, particularly with the threats that we have on the horizon and the structural reforms. Now Sven Gigold for Greens. Thank you. Madame Lagarde, uh, first I uh, would like to say that uh, the European Central Bank, uh, which you are now uh, being candidate to lead, is clearly the most uh, powerful economic institution in Europe. And I would like to say that it's a good sign if a powerful woman applies for that job and for the first time ever this institution could be led by a woman. That is a good sign because still finance is a male-dominated world, and it is progress uh, in this world is if women are candidate for the, such a post. Beyond that, I would like to say it was the ECB which saved the euro. And we should all know it were not politicians. It was the ECB which saved the euro, uh, and, uh, and it was faced uh, after the an, uh, res respective monetary policy with an unprecedented level of monetary populism. What I mean with this is a criticism of monetary policy which was needed because politicians didn't do their job to cooperate more closer, to build a stronger common market and to build a real European democracy. And this is the reason why the ECB had to be so aggressive in its monetary policy stand. And it's so important uh, that you were saying now, you see the problems. Uh, and the concerns of citizens because of the negative side effects of the aggressive uh, monetary policy stand. And therefore, we ha I had the impression that at least your predecessor was giving up on the part of the population. He was not communicating anymore openly and uh, convincingly why this is needed. And therefore, I would like to know, could you be more specific which negative side effects you see and how you intend to overcome and communicate uh, uh, about these negative side effects. 
And secondly, in your written remarks, you are opening the door for a greening of monetary policy. And it's clear, no financial and monetary stability can exist without fighting climate change. And the European Central Bank has to play its role as the most powerful economic institution. But in your written answers, you are saying, uh, well, the ECB will need to assess whether and how it can apply uh, this. This is not strong enough. Can you be stronger and bolder on greening monetary policy and asset purchasing uh, by your institution under your leadership? Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity of expressing my personal view on that particular matter. And I'm being cautious because I don't want to bind or to try to have any undue influence on existing governing council and their decision-making process because I'm only volunteering for the job and I'm not the president. My personal view on those issues is that any institution has to actually have climate change risks and protection of the environment at the core of their understanding of their mission. Primary mandate, price stability, of course, but it has to be embedded in that, that climate change and environmental risks are mission critical. And I believe that charity begins at home. So what we did at the IMF, for instance, is focus on what as an institution, as you know, 3,000 people behaving in one, under one single roof, what can we do, what can we improve, how can we be more effective in that respect, number one. Number two, quickly on the IMF and then I'll, I'll jump to the ECB. We, as I said, had climate change finally accepted as a macro-critical risk. And as a result of that, the fiscal department and various other departments at the IMF focused on the grants and uh, uh, subsidies that were given uh, to burning fossil fuel, for instance, the direct and the indirect cost of doing so. Uh, we also focused on fiscally responsible budgets in that respect. Let me now turn to the, uh, the ECB, and again, without prejudice to what is happening and to what maybe I will be able to achieve, because governing council at the end of the day uh, decides under the leadership of its president. Same thing, charity begins at home. Number two, there is a pension fund that is actually managed by the ECB, which can certainly take decisions in respect of where it invests. Number three, participating in the network for greening finance. And when you have a bunch of central bankers saying climate change risks are material risks that need to be assessed by banks in their jurisdictions, if I'm a bank, I become a bit concerned and I start at looking at my provisioning and I start at looking at the portfolio management that I have as a result of that. And in terms of its investment, I'll be super quick uh, on that. In terms of investment, obviously, uh, the ECB cannot exclusively invest its you know, 2.6 trillion portfolio into green um, bonds because there is not enough of a market. But if it signals that it will be increasing and will be intensively looking at that, then it's also for the market something to register in terms of where it's going to direct its funding. Thank you. The uh, slot for ID is for Hervé Chavan. Thank you very much indeed, Chairman. Uh, warm welcome to you, Madam. I have a question. You touched on it in your introductory remarks. A lot has been said about the multipolar world we're headed towards, and often I have the feeling that we're now going through the affirmation of two aggressive empires pursuing their own interests. You've got the Americans with the dollar, and then the Chinese with the renminbi. But for my part, I think a euro, which is broadly accepted for international settlement, and which is a reserve tool used broadly by central banks, could be um, a tool for the sovereignty of European nations. So a question for you. In the context of your mandate, how will you act to make sure that the euro becomes an international settlement a currency, a reserve money that it should be? And how do you think that the euro and the systems in the banks will become... Uh, robust against external shocks, and I'm thinking here about uh, U.S. embargoes and other tools. Um, another question, but you have actually touched on this broadly. 
I believe that the credibility of a monetary system depends to a great degree on trust, confidence, that the citizens place in its ability to meet its commitments in time. So it's not hyperinflation that threaten us in time, but, and you said this, it's actually the environmental crisis and the disappearance of ecosystems and even uh, the uh, crisis of humanity. So in this context the, and regarding the credibility of the European monetary system, what can you do, practically speaking, during your mandate to adopt tools to deal with uh, this crisis of confidence in time? Well, thank you very much indeed for that double question. On your first question, the euro as a reserve currency and a payment tool internationally and recognized as such uh, in the context of these two empires that are confronting each other in, on the trade uh, stage today. Euro, the euro today is already a reserve currency. It's not the reserve currency because in spite of efforts made by other central banks and authorities. It is nevertheless the dollar, which is the international reserve currency and the payment instrument. But these are things that are changing. There is evolution here, and I think you have to watch that space. And you have to give the euro the range of inference instruments it needs to become an international uh, currency for settlement and f as a reserve tool as well. And in my view, the payment system uh, has to be uh, efficient and protected. That is something we have to presuppose. And it also means that European capital markets, particularly in the Eurozone, have to be much better developed than they are already today. And here I'd like to pay tribute to the European Parliament and to President or Chairman Gualtieri, because I know that uh, you attach great importance to the deepening and the strengthening of the capital markets uh, in Europe. But we haven't got uh, far enough yet. The capital markets in Europe, uh, this isn't actually within the remit of the ECB, but nevertheless, this is a, fine, a, a very important factor when it comes to financial stability. If you multiply the sources of financing and access to financing for all economic operators, and if you provide an alternative to banking systems, then you are also going to strengthen the role of the euro. Then there's the third stage, which I think is also very interesting as, a, as an avenue to explore, but it's perhaps more to do with long-term thinking, but that is to think about an instrument because we've got American Treasury bonds which make up uh, you know, the last resort tool, uh, but we don't have an equivalent of that for the Eurozone economies today that would be equal. Uh, we don't have a tool that's equal to that task for that zone. So we need excellent payment systems that need to be deepened and strengthened. And then when it comes to capital markets and when it comes to strengthening our uh, arsenal of tools, as we said earlier here, I'm thinking of simplification and better coordination for coordinated fiscal policies and strengthening of the banking systems. So we have a, a European deposit de guarantee mechanism as well. All of these things would help, I think, to strengthen the euro as reserve currency. Um, and these are things, I think this was a German economist who said this, but all of these things happen very, very slowly until finally there's a trigger and it happens extremely quickly. So I think we have to be prepared for that kind of development. I've reached my time limit. Now for ECR, uh, the uh, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to ask my question in Dutch, if you don't mind. I want to talk about uh, negative interest uh, rates because I think it is clear, Mrs. Uh, 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 Lagarde, uh, uh, all options are uh, open, but I would like to ask what you th uh, think about what negative interest rates mean for uh, savers and um, re uh, retirees in uh, 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 the Netherlands, where I'm from, uh, people are not getting uh, uh, any interest, but inf inflation is running at 3%. And uh, that means that as a result of increases of uh, prices, etc., uh, they are losing out. So uh, they're angry 
and uh, they're suffering a loss, an effective loss of a uh, three percent, and uh, so uh, they're uh, losing a, a lot of uh, capital. It's just disappearing, and they're blaming the ECB for this. And if you uh, uh, start with uh, negative interest rates, uh, then you'll just be making things worse. And uh, you will soon become uh, the, the, the queen of the euro, la reine de l'euro. But uh, if, if uh, you focus on uh, negative uh, interest rates, uh, then uh, there will be a negative focus on you because we need to uh, reward savers. And uh, the, the, uh, I promise that uh, people are very upset about this. Merci beaucoup pour, pour, pour cette... Thank you very much uh, for that question. I do not speak Dutch, so I'll, I'll, resort, to, uh, I'll resort to English. Um, you know, your question points exactly to uh, one of the answers, or two of the answers that I have given earlier on uh, to um, some of the speakers. We always need to have that cost-benefit analysis in whichever uh, tool is being deployed. And I think we need to be mindful of the multiple roles and facets of populations. Some people are borrowers, some people are lenders, uh, some member states are heavily indebted, others are less so. And there are distributional impact of whatever interest rates are determined. So when we review the monetary framework, and when we assess and evaluate the effectiveness of the tools that have been used, we need to have in mind all these roles and decide to which extent and how deeply some of the tools can be used to net positive effect. If it becomes contractionary, it be if it becomes to reverse in view of the objective that has been set by the mandate, and with in mind the downside for the people and the upside for the people, then clearly there has to be a revision. But for the moment, it is clear that with the threats that are on the horizon, highly accommodative monetary policy is needed, probably for a period of time. And again, this is without prejudice to what the central bank will decide in the next couple of months, which is not of my jurisdiction, of course. Can I, if I may, because I have one minute that I want to use. Uh, we need to save a little bit. Huh? We need to save a little bit. Okay, but just very, very quickly. On, on your point about the, the queen or the, or the bad, uh, the bad fairy, I'm totally irrelevant. Where I become relevant is if I can actually help communicate the purpose, the intent, and the objectives that are being pursued. That is something that I believe is, is important and something that I will be very keen to develop in the most effective way, not addressing the financial market operators because they understand all, any languages and any of these acronyms that we play right, left and center. I want the people of the Euro area to understand why decisions are made, what impact it has, what is the ultimate goal, whether there is a downside first and then benefits later on. That, that is certainly something that I intend to spend energy and time on. Thank you. Uh, last in the first round is Madame Manon Aubry from uh, GUE. Bonjour. Good morning, I'm over here. You looking for me? Here I am, right in the middle. So, good morning. I just wanted to follow up what Sven said. As the first woman speaking here today, I think it's... Uh, uh, you could note the uh, 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 presence of... Uh, uh, relative presence of men and women here in the room. I just wanted to uh, ask you about two important subjects. The first being the struggle against inequality and the second being the struggle against climate change. And whatever you might think I, uh, about them, monetary policy has an important role in both of these areas. I used to work for Oxfam until very recently 
which works on these two fronts, you made some declarations to the uh, IMF on the uh, subject of inequality that I thought were very interesting. But I must say, I was rather disappointed when I saw your responses to the questionnaire. The word inequality only appears twice, whereas price stability uh, uh, re reappears 28 times. So that does raise some question marks for me as to your uh, priorities as president of the ECB. Well, of course, climate and uh, inequality are linked. Huge sums of money were injected into the banking system. It's a lot more than was, uh, has been loaned to uh, households and uh, companies. All of this money has gone into financial speculation, which only helps the richest. Your predecessor, Mario Draghi, said, yes, it's true, the rich are the first beneficiaries of quantitative easing. I mean, I'm just quoting what he said. What concrete measures are you prepared to take to ensure that monetary policy decisions will benefit the real economy and not just feed into speculation? And what about the uh, uh, inflation rate targets where we have a low real growth but huge speculative bubbles being inflated? Since 2003, there hasn't been any change in uh, the price stability growth of the ECB. Do you think that this should be considered? Then the climate issue was actually mentioned quite a lot in your questionnaire. That was a good thing. We'd be interested in something like a Green New Deal, but uh, that's, there's two questions. First of all, how can we stop financing polluting energy? If you look at the... Uh, uh, private debt purchases from the ECB, a lot of these have gone into uh, uh, polluting companies. You say, oh, only the uh, market decides, but there are no environmental uh, criteria in terms of the assets the uh, ECB buys. You talk about green bonds, but the scale of this market is very limited. And we don't want, you say you don't want to distort the market. Well, there's a bit of a paradox. How can we finance the uh, uh, green transition when went to finance these objectives, where well, we're talking about 150 billion euros a year as the, as the uh, euros a year as the minimum. But you say, well, page 26, we have to recognise that monetary policy is not a panacea. It is not the key policy for fighting against uh, uh, climate change. Well, how can we reorientate monetary policy on climate change? Well, what about the possibility of lending to? Uh, uh, the countries. En ce qui concerne le, la, votre question sur la, la lutte contre les... Thank you very much. Well, on your issue of fighting against inequality, it is a subject where I have uh, uh, been getting the IMF involved. I've worked very closely with Oxfam. That's a, a, a partner that we've tried to work with a, a lot. It's a concern that I will continue to uh, have close to my heart. It's clear that price stability, though, is going to remain the main anchor of the uh, European Central Bank. Article 27 says it is the primary objective. There, is, there are secondary objectives, which, as far as I'm concerned, are not secondary. But once you have price stability, then you can start looking at the other economic objectives of the other institutions. For example, the objective of protecting the environment can't certainly be taken into account by the ECB and its policies. I haven't got a lot of time to respond. As for greening, how can we do this in practice? Green bonds? Indeed. Well, there's not enough of them, and the ECB has already done its job. There's a very good uh, paper that's been uh, uh, put forward by my predecessor that I think was very good, and I would like to work further along those lines. There's another issue, which is deciding what is green and what isn't green. We've got a whole palette of different classifications and labels and uh, things like that. I think a bit more clarity in this area would be uh, good. The ECB is involved in refinancing uh, operations for products that are arriving at maturity. And I think that it should be interesting if we could try and uh, change direction and move towards greener products. So I will continue to be looking at that.
it's, uh, I'll be thinking about how the ECB can be an actor in this. Round to grant at least uh, some chance of equality among the members, we have to shorten the slots to four and a half minutes. So please uh, make a question short if you want to get uh, the answer. The first and second round is Mr. Otmar Karas. Madame Legarde. Um. Uh, for me, the independent ECB is not the cause of our worries and problems but part of the solution. You explained the challenges uh, we, are, we have. I have two questions. Um, first, how would you intend to use your global perspective? Your success as chairman of the International Monetary Fund, including your activities at G20 and the financial support programs in some member states of the EU, uh, Troika in your role as president of the ECB. Secondly, I think uh, that we currently experience the following deficit. Some politicians increasingly put the blame on the ECB, making it responsible for their own policy failures by criticizing the low level of interest rates. This criticism falls on fertile ground and in turn leads to a lack of understanding for the independence of the ECB. How would you intend to tackle this deficit? Those are very broad questions. Thank you. You know, I think in potentially becoming president of the ECB, uh, I come together with the experience that I have uh, earned in my various positions. And what I have witnessed, uh, both on the G20 finance, on the G20 leaders, on the various G7 that I have observed, is that there is extreme efficiency in those groupings when there are extreme challenges. And it is not that I wish we have those challenges, because you know I certainly do not, would not want to volunteer for any big financial crisis simply in order to uh, demonstrate that the G20 or the G7 actually perform. What I would like to do is actually contribute to a sense of urgency, despite the fact that the crisis is not upon us. Because if we do not have this sense of urgency, uh, there will be continued procrastination. And I'm not saying that with any um, you know, contempt or any, any um, criticism, but I think it's, it comes from human nature and from the political elections as they are, that people will resort to their territory, will resort to their national interests, will be limited to the fiscal horizon, or will, limit it, will be limited to the monetary horizons, or will always find somebody else to do the structural reforms. So, Having been in those various positions as finance minister in charge of fiscal, as head of the International Monetary Fund, trying to um, identify better regulations, better policy mix, is hopefully to instill a sense of better cooperation, better coordination, understanding of what the priorities of the various players at the table are. I'm not, you know, um, I'm not a fairy, as one of you actually said earlier on, but I will certainly devote my energy to trying to enhance uh, this determination to address problems collectively, because the problems are of a collective nature. Whether you talk climate change, uh, whether you talk financial stability, whether you talk cyber risks, whether you talk money laundering, whether you talk uh, you know, tax um, systems, whether you talk competition policies, all of that is of a global nature because the real economy has reached that level of globality. And in response to that, in order to avoid the, the sentiment that people have that their destiny is no longer in their hands and that their national responsible representatives cannot deal with the issue, we have to collectively find the responses to those challenges. And I think this parliament is a critically important actor in that game. Thank you. Next question, Pedro Marquez from SND. Thank you so much, uh, Chair. Uh, Madame Lagarde, bonjour. Uh, monetary policy has proved to be essential to the stabilization of the Eurozone, of course. Mr. Draghi's commitment in 2012 
was absolutely essential to stop the attacks to the sovereign debt. Even if it came some years later, then it probably should have, at least seeing from countries like mine, Portugal. Given the current economic environment, do you maintain the pledge from the ECB, if you are to be the president, to do whatever it takes to preserve the Eurozone? Do you commit to maintain and eventually create new unconventional monetary policy instruments that might be needed to sustain the Euro? For the Eurozone to sustain its prosperity, we also need to complete the institutional framework. That much you have concurred in your answers to the European Parliament. So, in terms of institutional framework, banking union, particularly the EDIs. I think that we have gone far enough in terms of stabilization of the banking system for us to take the step, the step of the creation of the EDIs. Do you agree? And about fiscal capacity to the Eurozone, you also say it's important in, in terms of institutional architecture. What steps would you take in the short term in terms of the creation of the fiscal capacity? And particularly the most critical aspect, which is the stabilization function. Would you concur, would you be able to support the creation of an instrument like the one supported by the president-elect for the European Commission, the Unemployment Reinsurance Scheme? We think, at our group, I think, that we strive for this fiscal capacity at the euro with the stabilization, stabilization arm. Do you agree? Merci bien for your, for your response. And the chairman will tell me that you've exhausted all the time, so I can't respond. So <laughs> no, I'll do that in a... Huh? I'll do that. May I? Okay. Um, you know, I was present when President Draghi actually said, we will do whatever it takes within our mandate, and believe me, it will be enough. I hope I never have to say something like that. I really do. Because if I had, it would mean that the other economic policymakers are not doing what they have to do. That's my, my, my analysis of it all. In addition to that, I would just remind you that when he said, we will do whatever it takes, I think then subsequently what was designed was the OMT, which eventually was never used. In the meantime, what has been very efficient uh, from the European institutions is the consolidation and the strengthening of the European stability mechanism, which I hope will be finalized, completed, made operational, will not be, um, uh, you know, sort of paralyzed by excessively rigid um, triggering mechanism. Because what I have experienced when we had the crisis and when we built the EFSF and then the ESM, and I apologize for these acronyms, is that we did not have the tools and we could not respond fast enough to the development of the crisis. But my duty, if I was elected, is embedded in stability of prices, primary objective. But there are multiple ramifications to stability of prices in order for monetary policy to be properly transmitted, for instance. So, it is... I'll tell you what we... Both on EDIS and the fiscal capacity, so I'll group them in, in one answer. What we certainly at the IMF recognized is the political inherent difficulties of lack of trust and confidence between some member states and others. I don't want to caricature here, but we all know what, we, what I mean. And our sense in our proposal was tit for tat. You reduce the non-performing loans, you submit to very rigid and rigorous stress tests, in, tests you accept maybe a high degree of supervision, in consideration for which EDIS actually applies across border without restrictions within the euro area. The same is true for the fiscal capacity. If it has to go further than the convergence and the competitiveness, it has also to be subject to conditions that guarantee those that are putting their money into that country that that country is actually responding and is facing a particular shock, but not an endemic and constant failure. Thank you very much. For Renew, now Pascal Canfan. Bonjour, Madame Lagarde. Uh, good morning, Mrs. Lagarde. I'd like to ask some more questions about the link between uh, your responsibilities and uh, climate change. Uh, uh, as a, a president of the Environment Committee, uh, you uh, referred to the analysis uh, carried out by Benoit Curé, which said that the fight against uh, climate change 
is already something which is covered by the ECB mandate uh, through various different channels. One is the question of uh, price stability, because if uh, we have a world where we have three or four degrees uh, increase in temperature, that will obviously have an impact. And also on uh, financial stability, it has been uh, noted by a number of uh, uh, central banks, uh, Mark Carney, for instance, uh, that we can't think about financial stability in the medium term without including the climate issue. And so I have three very specific questions for you. The first, are you making a commitment to use uh, the uh, taxonomy of uh, green assets uh, that the Parliament and the Council are currently negotiating? Secondly, you referred uh, to uh, what uh, uh, the ECB has done on uh, greening, but it has also uh, been said that a lot of uh, the uh, assets are very much uh, related uh, to uh, carbon. And so what do you intend to do with those assets? And uh, obviously you'll be speaking in a personal capacity, but uh, how do you think that uh, there can be a move away from these carbon assets? And then thirdly, what do you intend to do to include in the ECB's macroeconomic analysis uh, climate issues much more than is done so today? Well, first of all, I truly hope uh, that the, uh, the taxonomy that you're currently discussing uh, will be uh, concluded successfully very soon, because I think this really is one of the key issues that is uh, currently holding things back, not only for the ECP, but uh, having participated in a number of uh, fora, including in uh, the private sector, I think the fact that there is uh, uncertainty about taxonomy and the classification and uh, the ranking of the products, it really is holding holding things back. So the more quickly you move uh, forward, the better it will be. And uh, 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 like some of you, uh, when you come uh, to the Parliament for the first time, I am uh, new uh, to the way in which the ECB uh, 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 will assess the, the taxonomy that you're working on, but I don't see any reason why the taxonomy determined uh, by the Parliament wouldn't be the rule which would be used by the ECP. I think uh, that would seem fairly obvious. Now, next. The current operators are telling me you have to have market neutrality. Well, yes, you do need market neutrality, but if you have a taxonomy which has been approved and by the Parliament, I think that would uh, uh, have to be taken on board. On uh, the uh, amount of assets which are uh, carbon assets are, uh, in the ECB now, obviously things can't change overnight. But if we move to a gradual transition to eliminate this type of uh, asset, I think that is uh, something that uh, needs to be done. If we are c convinced of uh, the absolute need uh, to combine our strengths uh, in all of our institutions to fight against climate change. And I think I would add a third dimension, which I also think is important, is that in the risk analysis that central banks carry out, that in their role as supervisors, they have to include uh, the climate uh, considerations and climate protection. And I think uh, that this is a uh, leverage which should not be uh, neglected in terms of uh, supply, in terms of risk weighting in the analysis which, which is carried out by banks. Thank you. Next speaker, uh, Ms. Edia Pereira from EPP. Thank you very much. Chair, Madam Lagarde, it's the first time that a woman will be leading the European Central Bank. And it's the first time that the mandate of the uh, uh, bank and uh, the commission uh, start at the same time. You're both women, and I think it's good. Once you're elected, you'll be able to work with us in this parliament to complete uh, economic monetary and monetary union, which is exactly what we need. Two questions. The, at the last meeting, the European Central Bank in the governing, governing Council on the 25th of July talked about measures for stimulating the European economy. The members of the Governing Council of the ECB talked about a possible package of measures such as reducing interest rates and uh, asset purchases. In March in Portugal, 
you said that we needed to increase uh, the rhythm of debt reduction. What you said is we need to fix the roof while the sun is shining. The countries of the Eurozone, particularly those with high levels of public debt like Portugal, have benefited from advantageous conditions for refinancing their debt. Do you think that these countries are doing enough or are they failing to take advantage of the favorable climate? A second question. Digitalization brings new challenges. Technologies like blockchain or uh, cryptocurrencies and new kinds of payment services are uh, key examples of this. Yves Mersch, who's a member of the, exec the executive committee of the uh, European Central Bank, talked about uh, the uh, Libra, the cryptocurrency set up by a number of major uh, technological com uh, companies as a major threat. Now, could this reduce the control of the ECB over the euro as a reserve currency? What is the right balance between the stability of the system and the, initiative, in, uh, the incentives for uh, innovation in financial services? Thank you. Obligada, yes. Um, fix the roof while the sun is shining. I borrowed that from John Fitzgerald Kennedy at the time. Um, and it's something that many economists have picked up and many policymakers have used in various um, speeches. Unfortunately, in many countries, it only stayed in the speeches and not in the actual measures that were taken. So while there is still growth now, and we have actually lived through both, you know, in, in most advanced economies, actually, an unprecedented period of growth, growth is now being threatened by external factors, and we have those tail risks that are of a serious nature, um, you know, whether it's the, the threats uh, to international trade, whether it's the uh, Brexit development, whether it's uh, the uh, geopolitical risks that abound, not to mention the, you know, the climate change risk that we mentioned, which is of a longer term nature, but requires short term measures. So fixing the roof is still something that applies. Um, and for some countries, they have the fiscal space to do it. For others, they have the ability to actually re-engineer uh, their fiscal policies in order to make it as growth friendly and facilitate the structural reforms that are needed. Um, on, you, on your second point, which I think really warrants um, a, a, a deep discussion, uh, the issue of technological changes and the balance uh, between costs and benefit of uh, technological changes. I think as a, as a general principle, central bank governors have to be very, very um, acutely aware of the development. They have to keep up to date constantly because changes are occurring on a daily basis. And they need to do that with in mind two things, in my view. Number one, financial stability and protection of consumers and investors for those who have this, uh, this mission. And number two, with a view to also facilitate and um, allow innovation. Because central bank governors, just like any other policymakers, cannot just cover their eyes and assume that things are going to stay forever. They will not. And whether you uh, travel to China and witness the cashless uh, telephone payment system uh, day long, night long, or whether you travel to California to see what the developments are, things are changing. And there are very innovative projects, including at the ECB. How many of you know of TIPS? That's what I feared. Because I, myself, I didn't know about TIPS. And TIPS yet is a system that was put in place by the ECB in November, which is not a thriving success yet. And though, has the potential to allow for expedited, instant payment between financial institutions in the euro area. We'll see how it works and we'll see whether um, banks are going to, you know, take ownership of that. But protecting financial stability, facilitating innovation, being part of the game, asking the question as to whether central banks should themselves be the originators of digital currencies. I think those are open questions that have to be addressed and have to be resolved. Thank you. Paul Tang from SLE.
Thank you. Um, Ms. Licarda, I would like to uh, come back to the question of fiscal capacity. Uh, I'm interested also since the IMF have been very um, focal on the need to introduce a central fiscal capacity um, and you put conditions on it. But do you think that delaying the introduction of a central budgetary capacity may jeopardize the macroeconomic stability in the Eurozone? Apart from the conditions that you put, but that's the question, uh, one of the questions to you, a very specific question. Do we still need it or do we, do we je jeopardize the macroeconomic stability? Uh, second is on Greece. The IMF has taken a turn on Greece, saying that the target for the primary su surplus is unrealistic. That is unsustainable and bringing, in fact, forward the, the possibility of debt relief. Do you still subscribe to these conclusions of the IMF? Uh, and if so, how will you take them on board if you become uh, the ECB president? Third, um, I very much welcome your emphasis on sustainability. Uh, that is much needed. I think the ECB has, is a role model and has an important role to play in uh, sustainable finance. Now, the ECB can support the general objectives, according to Article 127 of uh, the TFEU, and particularly in uh, climate action and sustainable finance. Do you think that these secondary objectives, given the primary mandate, should be clarified? Would it help if the European Parliament uh, would prioritize uh, the ECB's secondary objectives, for example, on, uh, on fighting climate change? Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I don't know. Let me be direct. I do not think that not delivering this fiscal stability um, mechanism that has been approved but not really defined and uh, clarified in terms of amount back at the um, Euro Area Finance Minister's meeting in June, I don't think that it is going to rock uh, the, um, the stability of the Euro Area. Yeah, okay. Equally, I think that for it to be strengthened and for it to be a real monetary zone with all its attributes, uh, it would be extremely helpful and very desirable to have that fiscal stability, not just for convergence and competitiveness, which are all laudable objectives, but also in order to respond uh, to a situation where a country has suffered a shock and is uh, having uh, liquidity uh, problem issues. So it's a necessary attribute in my view. If it is not here now, the macro stability will nonetheless um, uh, survive, but it's very much needed going forward. On Greece and the primary surplus, this has been an ongoing debate uh, within the Troika, particularly in the last couple of years of the IMF involvement on the Greek program. And I think we have consistently, and we have been on record, to say that 3.5% primary surplus is, in our view, IMF, and I'm speaking here still and in my capacity, is excessive and is putting unduly pressure on the recovery of the Greek economy as it, as it is hoped for. So I think our inst the IMF is still of that view. And uh, while we are seeing that Greece is undergoing recovery, uh, it's, it's a process that will have to be uh, in my assessment uh, reviewed very carefully. Now, it is very um, useful that the Governing Council has actually revised and limited the mandate of the ECB in relation to programs and has limited the role of the ECB to its objectives and its priorities. You know, I remember those endless uh, Euro area finance ministers and central bank governors meetings where arcane details of the type of structural reforms uh, were discussed with um, Mario Draghi and his esteemed staff in the room. And I remember you know, vividly seeing them thinking, what can we contribute in that debate? Uh, because it was not their core competency. And, and clearly the fact that in the future the ECB will be limiting its review to the areas where it has competency, I think is, is very welcome. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, we, have, we have no time. <laughs> Maybe later. Uh, Damien Karem on behalf of Greens. 
Oui, bonjour, Madame Lagarde. Good morning, uh, Madame Lagarde. Uh, now, given what's already been said, I'll be a bit redundant here, but uh, you've talked about the taxonomy now, and given the climate urgency that we're certainly all aware of now, um, you've talked now here before the Parliament to, to put together a green methodology within the ECB for purchasing of uh, active or assets, um, and also reassessing the, the dirtier assets, as it were, to try to uh, remove them from the balance sheet. And as you said, the idea is to look at the statistics that exist, which show that 63% of asset purchases are actually um, benefiting the dirtiest, biggest polluters and corporates, uh, corporations in the European Union. Now, the ECB meets regularly with the representatives of the big banks in the financial sector, but doesn't have a structural dialogue with citizens and civil society yet. So would you accept the creation of such a forum annually uh, in the context of which the ECB and uh, civil society organizations would be able to exchange views on uh, European monetary policy? Finally, as a representative of the Finnish presidency, as they have announced this morning, would you be committed to reforming ethics rules and transparency in the ECB to make it uh, uh, obligatory to finance, uh, publish meetings with uh, lobbyists of all of the governors? Because that's currently not the case. Merci beaucoup. Sur votre... Thank you very much indeed. On your last question, I know the code of ethics and good conduct has already been uh, overhauled. There were deemed conflicts of interest between the uh, bankers and the members of the private sector, so I'm very happy that this code of conduct is being applied as broadly as possible. I, with regard to the ECB hierarchy, I don't know where the code, code is applied or where it stops being applied, but I think it's important to be uh, as transparent as possible because that is in the interests of ethical principles and also it means we can uh, facilitate all contacts uh, and uh, timetabling that come into play there. Uh, I can't commit myself here at this stage because I'm not uh, totally au fait because obviously this is contingent on the governing board as well. On a f an annual forum here, I can't take uh, a premature, make a premature commitment to this, but what I can say is that at the IMF, we set up and uh, intensively developed this kind of consultation. And uh, people who know the circuit well at the IMF know that uh, Ten years ago, NGOs and civil society organizations were very much outside the institution. And uh, with a very fruitful and enriching dialogue over the years, and we don't always agree, by the way, but nevertheless, we managed to set up in train a constructive dialogue, uh, an active one, bringing into play representatives uh, from 89 different countries and we had uh, three-day conferences annually uh, that required a lot of energy, a lot of commitment, um, equally from the management of the institution. So I'm not promising that right now, but I certainly feel that the dialogue that we had with civil society representatives was absolutely fundamental for us to be able to better understand their expectations, give us an opportunity to better explain what we're doing and also explain the limits of the actions we were undertaking and also try to sort of uh, push ourselves uh, in terms of what we were able to achieve with regard to the um, civil society representatives. Now, on methodology, if a taxonomy is set up and approved by the European Parliament, then we'll have to look at how it can be applied in practice, how it, we can improve the carbon uh, stats when it comes to these bonds reaching maturity. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of ID. Chair, Madam President, the IMF and soon the ECB will be uh, enjoying your services. So uh, good afternoon, Madam Lagarde. According to the EU treaty, 
there can be no uh, communitarization of this public debt, and there can be no direct purchases of bonds on the primary markets. And according uh, to the, the previous directive, then no per secondary market purchases are allowed either. Nevertheless, since 2010, and particularly since the entry into office of uh, your predecessor, the uh, president of ECB, Mr. Draghi, who's still in office, then that has been exactly what has been going on. As uh, French finance minister in 2010 or in 2011, I've always I actually appreciated the fact that you said to that the eurozone member states had thus broken the law to save the euro. Well, you're not just a famous politician, but also a renowned uh, legal expert. My question to you is, will you continue to do what your predecessor has done and uh, care, uh, break the law in the most carefree manner that whenever member states or companies uh, want to have their debts reduced, then you will help? And uh, a price stability is a very... Uh, clear rule. Will you be talking about more or less 2% uh, inflation? Sometimes it's slightly more than 2%, as we've heard earlier this morning. But what about savers and taxpayers who are, had the least responsibility for the financial crisis? Why are they losing out? And then there's the uh, principle of countries being responsible for their own budget balance. I think, th will you continue to hollow that out? And then a, a, a secondary question. If you say yes to all of that, how do you justify the approach that the ECB has taken, which is basically to say that it's above the law? Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Um, thank you so much for your question. Um, the issue of financing of member states' budget is, is one issue that has been uh, debated, that has been reviewed uh, by the jurisdictions, uh, not only at the European level, but also at national levels. And I think you know, there is a, a body of jurisprudence that is building up in order to identify the perimeters of what is uh, legitimate action and what would uh, become illegitimate action. And I think that this is uh, precisely within those boundaries that the institution must continue to, to operate. Um, you know, it, it is a fact that during the financial crisis, not only at a national level, but on, on, a, on a global basis sometimes, on a regional basis sometimes, we had to transgress. I wouldn't call it violation of the treaties, but there were areas where there was no provision, there was no space, and nobody had any clue as to what could be done in order to save uh, the financial situation, in order to protect the deposits of the depositors and the savers. And it is true that during that incredible period of 2008-2009, pretty much everybody had to actually transgress rules and, and do that for the public good in order to make sure that people would not lose their deposit, would not lose their savings. You know, I often hear, you protected the financial system. No, we made sure that there was no meltdown and no bank run that would have precipitated the loss of depositors, deposits and savings. So I think that that was very much uh, justifiable and very much uh, needed. Quickly on, on, you know, the 2% uh, below but close to. I think what, has, what is being debated currently at the ECB, and, and I'm not privy to all those discussions, of course, now, is the understanding that it can be uh, attained from below so moving from 1.6 to 1.7 to 1.8 to whatever. But it can also be attained from above. And I think the objective of the medium-term 
below but close to 2% should be understood in, the, in that particular respect. That's my understanding of the debates at the moment. And I think it's, it's appropriate that there is an understanding that it's acceptable from under, but also from above. Next speaker, ECR, Johan van den Overveld. Thank you. Always good to see you, uh, Madame Lagarde. Uh, I have three statements, and I would uh, very much like to ask you uh, to uh, answer whether you agree with them or not, and if not, why. First of all, you pointed out yourself earlier that it's very difficult to detect the economic relevance of the difference between an inflation rate of, say, 1.2 percent or one point or one of uh, 1.8 percent, say. Still, on the basis of such shaky argument, uh, very uh, extraordinary policies are not only uh, installed but also continued. Uh, that seems unjustifiable to me. Secondly, we see worldwide, certainly in the industrial, uh, industrialized world, a slowdown of productivity to which these unconventional monetary policies contribute by keeping the so-called zombie companies alive, being companies that can only survive while benefiting from very, very low interest rates. And thirdly, um, these uh, policies that are, are pursued uh, weigh heavily on the income potential of uh, insurance companies, pension funds, and banks. And so in that way, and also in other ways, but certainly in that way, these policies are contributing to financial instability. Thank you. Thank you very much, and that gives me an opportunity to clarify what I was saying earlier about the 2 percent. It's uh, not at all to uh, uh, undermine the relevance and significance of the debate, because I think that it is very important. I do think it is something which is uh, leading to expectations, uh, to uh, serious thinking. And uh, the debate between uh, experts, technical experts, is extremely important. I was uh, just uh, mentioning a comment which was made by the governor of uh, the Australian Central Bank who called for a minimum of a f a flexibility in looking at uh, the inflation targets. To you. I'm very sorry about that. Um, on, is it, on the other hand, uh, you mentioned the issue of um, very low financing costs, which has facilitated the survival of companies that would otherwise uh, have probably disappeared. Again, one has to conduct a cost-benefit analysis. Had it not been for this uh, low financing cost that we have at the moment, you know, how much would have been lent? How many enterprises would actually finance expenditures? Uh, in particular, some of the uh, programs that were determined by the ECB, such as the targeted financing uh, mechanisms, actually were intended to encourage companies to lend. Now, has enough of that taken place? Probably not. Can the instruments be refined in order for them to actually reach their target? I would believe so. Thank you. Now we are starting the last third of the, of the questions, and we should probably target rather four minutes than four and a half. Now, Jose Garcia Margal from EPP. Thank you very much indeed, Chairman, and a warm welcome to you as candidate. I'm delighted to see here, you here again. You're before us here in a very different time from Draghi in 2015. Draghi arrived during an existential crisis when he still had a margin for maneuver with interest rates and so on, which were still positive. But you're arriving when the sun is still shining, but uh, uh, profit yields are getting lower and uh, people are looking worried in the manufacturing sector and monetary policy is seeing very different kinds of interest rates. So given the crisis that we've seen, well, there are different explanations for that. Uh, Rubini, I think, gave a good explanation 
of what might still come. It's about uh, demand and supply balances, and we have different uh, policy tools available, but we're going to have to act differently. When it comes to monetary and fiscal policy, that will be the short-term tool, but in the longer term, we're going to have to look at structural tools. So that's the context. The question is, how much time do you think we have in the European economy, not to mention the world economy, before we have negative interest rates in place without actually affecting banks and other institutions? Secondly, given the role that structural reforms will have to play in purchasing assets, would it be reasonable to change the rules which currently link purchasing power of a country to its, the size of its uh, uh, economy rather than brand, branding countries as good or bad. And then experiencing has shown that uh, it might be reasonable that in a context of structural reforms, we're going to have to give a greater role to corporate uh, goods or capital in the future. And when it comes to private bonds, do you think they should be included in the basket of uh, assets for the ECB in the future, uh, particularly in the context of the possibility of negative interest rates. So thank you very much for answering my questions and I wish you every success uh, in what I hope will be your next mandate at the ECB. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. I too would like to see you in other circumstances than crisis uh, situations. Um, you know, you asked me the very precise question to which I cannot give a precise answer. You know, for how long are we going to have negative rates? Uh, it's not a question that I can answer. Um, because clearly price stability is the imperative. The set of tools that have been used uh, are used to their, to their full. Um, and while there is still amplitude uh, in order to develop some of them, uh, it's impossible to actually say when, under what circumstances, and how, because a cost-benefit analysis will have to be conducted of the use of the tools. I think the only thing that we have clear in our mind at the, mo at the moment, which the Governing Council has issued very clearly, is that um, forward guidance will, uh, sorry, the um, purchase program will stay as they are uh, until such time when the interest rates will not be raised. So we know the sequence that it will adopt, and we know that forward guidance is also being strengthened. That, that's what we are, we are seeing at the moment. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by the, the purchasing of the, uh, the bonds of virtuous virtu versus non-virtuous countries. I think one needs to be careful not to bring in too much of the sort of morality stress test into the exercise and to use uh, the ECB keys on the one hand to apply the threshold of 50 or 33 percent in order not to give an overriding role to the ECB in those purchases, I think, should continue uh, as they are. And um, there were the, there were, uh, maybe we can pursue that discussion later, because I, I sort of understood that you were referring to the tiering system in some way in your questions. But we can pursue that offline. Thank you very much. Now, uh, uh, Ergin Eroglu from uh, Renew. We don't have? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, Frau Lagarde, herzlich willkommen. Madame Lagarde, uh, warm welcome to our committee. Well, over the last two hours, there have been quite a lot of questions for you. But there's one that I would like to look at more deeply with you, and that's the issue of digital currencies and cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin, for example, has become much more important in recent years. To what extent is this a competition to the euro and the ECB? How can money laundering and uh, criminality be combated uh, in the use of uh, cryptocurrencies? How can the ECB uh, be working? Another question that we haven't had yet is that in Germany, we've currently got negative interest rates, and uh, the response is in Germany is very negative for small savers, for uh, German uh, sparkassen, the small savings banks and cooperative banks, this is really difficult. 
as you see it, do you think it's unavoidable, unavoidable to have a reduction in the number of banks? Or do you think that the diversity of the banking market in Germany could actually be an asset in dealing with an upcoming uh, economic and financial crisis? I hope you're not asking me my view on a particular merger. <laughs> so, thank you so much for bringing um, us back to the digital, digital currencies, because I think it's, it's, uh, it's important. The principle that I set out earlier on, on, you know, number one, financial stability, uh, and avoidance of risks, but number two, allowing, allowing the innovation and not stifling it, I think remains. I would distinguish between, you know, cryptocurrencies a la bitcoins, uh, which, you know, certainly can be analyzed uh, differently depending on where they are reviewed. There are places in the world where they are regarded as assets. There are places in the world where they're regarded as currencies. There are places in the world where they're regarded as securities. So it's, there's a whole, um, chaos of the proper analytical framework for such thing. But in the main, what we have observed recently is that it has been a fairly speculative and highly volatile product, uh, and uh, one that is not sufficiently large to actually threaten uh, stability and be um, a hindrance uh, to um, the proper transmission of monetary policy. I would distinguish that from the stable coins, which are, a, in my view, a different type of animal and uh, which probably have a different future. But that being said, I believe that stable coins, whether they are the Libras of this world uh, or um, central bank uh, digital currencies, they have to be um, in compliance with all the rules and regulations that apply to the activity. So I'm not overly concerned about, you know, is it a bank? I think it's far more important to focus on the activity that is conducted by those groupings um, to make sure that there is full compliance with the regulations that apply to those products. And in that vein, I would suggest that um, anything that protects against money laundering, uh, against the financing of terrorism, against uh, financial stability, against proper transmission of monetary policy should be paramount when assessing whether those products should be allowed to prosper in our region of the world and possibly in other places, which is why I'm, I'm, I was really pleased to see that Benoit Curé uh, of um, the ECB was tasked by the G7 to actually look at those digital currencies, consult as broadly as possible, and come back with some findings as to you know, its appropriateness or not. Thank you. Now for non-attached, we have Per Nicola Pedicini. Grazie, President. Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Madame Lagarde. I was here a few months ago when, in the, in the plenary in Strasbourg, uh, Jean-Claude Juncker was present, and he admitted before all of the parliamentarians that he had listened too much to the suggestions of the International Monetary Fund in terms of imposing austerity policies on the Greek economy and its people. It's clear to everybody now that the crisis, uh, in the crisis of 2008 and 2011, what we were facing was a lack of regulation of the financial markets. Now, the econ economists have been saying and continue to say that they should be the markets should be self-regulating but we've got problems like inequality out there and they say that the problem is actually the um, the problem of inter intervention of governments rather than the lack of regulation that's the mainstream economic uh, economists so what is your view about some kind of possible reform of the EU treaties giving the ECB a new role, making the ECB the lender of last resort that uh, would allow it to intervene in a differentiated manner in individual member states according to the needs of those member states. According to the uh, statutes, that we, there, would also be a, uh, there could also be an inclusion of unemployment and not just price stability. 
Well, any change to the mandate of, of the ECB is something that belongs to the member states. It's not something that the ECB can invent. And, you know, it ser seriously cannot move from price stability to price stability plus uh, uh, fight against unemployment plus uh, uh, sustainable growth. Uh, there is a caveat in Article 127, subparagraph 2, which actually allows the ECB, as long as the primary objective of price stability is satisfied, to actually look at the secondary objectives that are those pursued uh, by, the, um, by the European institutions, by the European Parliament, by the European Commission, by the European uh, Council. Um, and that gives me a chance to actually clarify in response to a previous question that the environment and the protection of the environment, if I recollect properly, is actually part of those objectives. So I think it legitimates the fact that uh, the fight against climate change can also be regarded as one of the secondary objective uh, of, of primary importance, but secondary objective of the ECB. Uh, you know, I'm not going to reopen uh, the Pandora box of uh, who did what in relation to the, uh, uh, the Greek programs, but I think it's, again, I think the IMF has gone on record, uh, particularly in the latter part of those programs, to indicate that the demands uh, vis-a-vis -vis Greece were excessive relative to its capacity uh, and that the 3.5% primary surplus uh, should be abandoned to the benefit of something that was more linear and that was closer to 1.5 or 2% at the most. So it's, you know, there was a troika. Uh, there, there, there were multiple decisions that were made by multiple actors. I don't think it helps to actually try to put the blame on one or the other. Uh, there was a joint endeavor and uh, that's where we stand. Uh, Greece had called us uh, in order to help, and uh, we tried to work as, as well and as hard as we can in order to help that country. But it is a fact that it suffered uh, heavily as a result of the, of the restructuring program that it went through. Thank you. Uh, Iran uh, Tinagli from SMD. I can, but maybe not everybody. Microphone, please. Thank you. So a lot has been said on the issue, on the topic of uh, green bonds, but most of the previous questions addressed uh, the demand side. But as you rightly pointed out, uh, also in the questioner, uh, we do have a problem of supply. And also in the, uh, in the questionnaire, you open to the possibility of a public intervention, intervention to create a broader universe for this uh, market. So my question, very straightforward, is uh, would you be in favor of a large public issuance, like a large issuance of green financial instruments by a European institution, such as, for example, the EIB? Uh, and do you think that the you know, ECB could support these issues? Of course, not buying on the primary market, which is not allowed by the treaty, but for example, accepting them as collaterals, uh, giving priority to these uh, bonds compared to other types of bonds. Second issue, uh, cryptocurrencies, you said uh, it's not a threat to the currency system or the financial stability, but I would like a very specific comment on uh, what the governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, said or proposed uh, this summer. So he launched the idea of a digital currency promoted by a network of central banks to challenge the hegemony of the dollar and replace it as the international reference. So I would like to hear a comment on your side on what could be the impact and uh, what kind of response the ECB could give. Thank you. On, on your first question uh, concerning the green bonds, uh, I believe that the EIB is already a significant issuer of green bonds, and my understanding is that the ECB on the secondary market is also um, purchasing uh, some of those products, and the threshold to which it can, con it can uh, subscribe to those green bonds is not the 33% that applies to other bonds issuance, but it's 50%, so it allows it to actually oversubscribed relative to other subscription of, of bonds. And I think that is that, that it's, it's good. Uh, I was also very pleased to see that um, uh, Ursula von der Leyen uh, has actually actively promoted uh, a green deal, whether it's a new green deal or green deal, but she certainly is of the view that those issues are of critical importance and I, I, I share that concern. Uh, on, the, on the cryptocurrency and uh, the um, 
the proposal articulated by Mark Carney. I was also very interested and intrigued uh, by his proposal. And uh, given the constant development that we have, given the, uh, um, I mean, in a nutshell, for those who did not have time to read the Mark Carney speech, he essentially proposes that some of the key central banks um, actually form a, a, a venture and that they explore together the formation of a joint central bank currencies. In other words, in a way, applying the principles that are on the mind of the Libra uh, conceptors, having an instrument that is convertible into various uh, sovereign currency. Uh, Mark Carney is, is proposing something that is similar in nature, but issued by the central banks themselves, uh, which, you know, has, has some... Uh, some really interesting ramifications. So I hope we can explore it, and you know, I cannot prejudge on what the governing council of the ECB will, uh, view will be, but uh, I, for myself, would, would certainly like to participate in this uh, exploring of that new concept. Thank you. Now we have Aniko Aguri from uh, EPP. Thank you so much. Madame Lagarde, I represent the citizens of a non-Eurozone country, namely Hungary. And uh, my first, I would have two short questions. The first one is about uh, the cooperation between Eurozone and non-Eurozone. And I think you would agree with me that it's of vital importance that there is a smooth cooperation uh, between uh, these two groups of countries. And whatever happens in the Eurozone has a very strong impact on the non-Eurozone countries. Um, there is a cough in the Eurozone, it may cause of pneumonia in, in the non-Eurozone countries. So my request is that whenever you prepare a new toolbox or whatever, you always take into consideration what kind of impact it has in the non-Eurozone countries. Um, there is a new proposal, which is partly was already approved, about the fiscal capacity for the Eurozone. And I'm sure that you are aware that it raised several cons negative concerns in the non-Eurozone countries. Uh, in your written answers, uh, you said that you, you liked this proposal. So how do you plan to address these worries by the non-Eurozone countries? And um, what about the conditions concerning uh, entering the Eurozone? Because there are newer conditions, like joining before the banking authority. It was already said at this meeting. So are you planning, or you think that the conditions how are at this moment are enough? or you are planning to maybe create newer conditions. And so I think the obligation on our side to become Eurozone members when we are prepared enough is there, but it, we would be very worried if there are newer and newer conditions on the path. And my second question is concerning the lessons learned from the last crisis. My country, Hungary, used a mixed toolbox, conventional, like structural reforms, conventional tools, and also some instruments which were not very much welcomed by financial institutions and the EU, but seemed to be working because Hungary for the second consecutive quarter of the year is producing the highest economic growth at the moment. Uh, you already <laughs> mentioned and praised the ECB's activity during the last crisis, and I wholeheartedly agree with you. Uh, what should be done differently by the EU institutions and the member states to affront if there is a negative a threat or a new crisis, uh, what, should, what should be done differently by the member states to avoid that the recovery in the EU is much slower than in other parts of the world? Thank you so much. Okay. First of all, I think that the cooperation between the Euro area member states and the non-Euro area member states is critically important because ultimately, while there are 19 of them at the moment, the aspirational goal is that there be 26 of them, Denmark being the opt-out country, and hopefully the UK having resolved its uh, situation one way or the other. So cooperation is, is vital because we are part of the same family and we are ultimately going to be together. So I would certainly consider that that is important. Um, yes, I did welcome the embryonic fiscal capacity that was identified uh, back in, uh, in early July. And I, I do welcome it as a first step. I think that you know, this uh, joint endeavor to improve competitiveness, to improve convergence is laudable, but it probably will have to go further, provided that the conditions are satisfied and that the member states can, can endorse it and can take ownership of it. 
So in that vein, again, cooperation with the non-euro area member states is, is vital because they would join uh, that grouping. It's, it's very minimalist at the, at the moment, but hopefully it will, it will increase over the course of time under the right conditions. Um, additional conditions for countries to join, uh, you know, clearly the path that is identified at the moment in respect of Croatia, for instance, seems to be a very uh, um, sound one, uh, joining the banking union, being subject to the uh, supervision principles and all of that I think is, is uh, uh, important. I personally, and I, I don't necessarily want to prompt any questions in that respect, but I personally believe that there has to be progress in the area of anti-money laundering and financing of terrorism. And in that vein, I don't know exactly what the requirements are for countries that actually join the euro area, uh, nor do I say that the current set of rules that apply within the euro area are sufficient. I think that they need to be improved, and there has to be better cooperation and better information in that respect. Thank you. For Goa, Dimitri Papademoulis. I will speak in Greek. Uh, welcome, uh, Mrs. Lagarde. I have uh, noted with great satisfaction all of the comments that you've made today about uh, the fact that it, we need uh, to reduce uh, uh, primary uh, surpluses in coming years. I've also taken due note of what you said about the fact that the Greek economy is recovering significantly and uh, has been for a little bit of time now, uh, slightly above the European average, in fact. And we have just received uh, the l latest figures, and now we have growth of 1.9 percent. And I hope uh, that the Greek uh, Prime Minister will also hear your proposal. And uh, our uh, Prime Minister, Mr. Mitsotakis, so that he does not abandon the efforts which have been undertaken by my country uh, when uh, d d discussing with uh, creditors uh, for uh, uh, surpluses lower than they were until now. And uh, I hope that he, uh, there will be the same ambition. But I did want to ask you something about everything that my country has suffered uh, through the first two uh, memoranda uh, with Mr. Uh, uh, Strauss-Kahn, Mr. Dysel, who talked about the multiplier effect, uh, which uh, 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 led to a much higher unemployment rate uh, than uh, could otherwise have been the case, and a greater recession. And they said that all of that was done to defend the interests of French and German banks. What do you think personally of that? Uh, the gentlemen that I just mentioned are, are um, uh, former presidents, but you are moving from the head of the IMF uh, to the uh, head of the ECB. So I think it is important for you to give us your opinion, because Pandora's box was opened uh, years ago and uh, at the expense of our country. and. Uh, uh, it's not a box that's going to be open now. It was already opened in the past. And then I also wanted to ask you about something else. The ECB has to work towards greater transparency uh, 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 than uh, the IMF. And so I wanted to ask uh, what you're going to do to increase transparency. Kalimera. I think I said what I had to say about the primary surplus in Greece and the fact that we have had um, under most of my leadership, a, a position that was different from the European Commission, and which at the end led us to uh, not participate in the third uh, portion of the, of the program. I think it's also fair to say in retrospect that many of the structural reforms uh, that were part of the overall package have not necessarily been delivered upon. And I very much hope that the new authorities in Greece will uh, continue what had been uh, initiated, but we'll go deeper into reforming the markets to make it more competitive, to make it more uh, efficient. And I, I can only celebrate that growth is picking up and that the activity of the country is being rejuvenated by more tourism, by more manufacturing activity as well. On the fiscal multiplier, um, the IMF 
has acknowledged, not only in respect of Greece, but also previously in respect of Portugal, which is at the time when we sort of looked into the fiscal multipliers impact on growth and on unemployment. So we acknowledge the fact that we had underestimated the fiscal multipliers impact on growth and unemployment. And then we revised, revisited and, and adjusted the objectives and the, uh, the measures that were expected out of the program. Now, is that to say that uh, it was the responsibility of one single institution or two or three, I think everybody was on the same page at that moment. And as I said, there's no point sort of allocating blames around, uh, but it's also critically important to acknowledge when something has been poorly designed or based on, on the wrong assessment. And, and we did so uh, in very explicit terms. We have a mechanism internally that is called the uh, internal evaluation office that does that job and we voluntarily uh, deliberated and debated uh, this issue. Transparency, I'm all in favor of as much transparency as possible and compatible with the independence of the institution and with the um, delivery on its mandate. Uh, but it's clearly uh, one that is most welcome and the debate that we will have if I was confirmed uh, five times a year, well, four times with uh, the Commission and then once in plenary session is certainly part of that transparency exercise that I very much welcome. Thank you. Dear colleagues, we have five questions uh, to the end, uh, including two KHDI that I have promised, and there are two requests from the, from the members finished. Uh, after one, probably we will continue just in English, and I would like to give at the beginning, uh, at the end, a few minutes to you to make a conclusive statement. So I guess we can finish five minutes after, after one, if you will be quick enough and formulate your questions. Uh, uh, short way because uh, Ms. Lagarde is uh, very efficient in the responses. Now, SND uh, Joachim Schuster. Well, thank you very much indeed. Many questions have been asked. I'll try and limit myself to two. First of all, it's clear that we have to continue the low interest rate policies. That's because fiscal policies are much too responsible restrictive in most member states. Of course, that has a negative effect for the central bank. And we have moved on to negative interest rates. In Germany, a proposal has been made by one party where they say there should be a legal ban on banks applying negative rates or passing on negative rates to uh, savers uh, with less than 100,000 euros in the bank. Well, what do you think about that? Is that legally possible or feasible? Then what about uh, uh, the risk sharing in the Eurozone? There are different interest rates in different uh, uh, member states, and that seems to be a ridiculous uh, uh, result, because that means that countries that are most indebted find it harder to actually uh, pay off their debts. And uh, what about the international role of the euro? If we are supposed to have a unified, uh, harmonized uh, monetary space, then how can we uh, ultimately avoid risk sharing? If that's the case, what kind of measures would you support to try and have some kind of rational, objective risk sharing in the eurozone? Thank you. Well, thank you, first of all, very much for linking uh, the, the interest rates level and the fiscal policies that have to be undertaken by some of the member states. I think this is part of the same debate, and it, it echoes what central bankers uh, did say during the crisis, which is that they are not the only game in town. And, and I think that there has to be that dialogue in order to um, calibrate properly both and in order to really measure the cost benefit of measures that at the moment are being required and necessary in order to uh, reach the mandate of price stability. You know, equally, I think that some macroprudential measures which have been developed over the course of time in order to address potential risks in particular segments have to be continued, have to be developed and have to uh, guard against potential uh, financial instability risk that would be caused by the current uh, financing systems in which um, corporate operates. I'm particularly concerned about, you know, uh, leverage um, lending, which, which 
you know, obviously financial stability board, most central bankers around the world are focused on, and I think we need to continue to monitor that very carefully in order to avoid the uh, formation of, of risk. And same apply to a certain extent to the real estate, where we have the macroprudential tools, but where they have to be used. Um, more risk sharing uh, within the euro area. Yes, that, that, would, that, that is the ultimate goal, because a monetary union should be about uh, uh, both the risks and the reward sharing all, you know, on the back of a, of, a, of a currency that is common to all. We are not yet at that stage, and we know that the euro area is, is not mission accomplished yet, and there are some components that are missing for it to be uh, mission accomplished. If you, if you look at the, the, the yields and, and, you know, measured by, um, on a country-by-country country basis on, on bonds that are issued, whether short-term or longer-term maturity, it's quite actually extraordinary how uh, little uh, spread there is between those various yields. And it's, it's quite amazing to see how much in the, in the last few quarters there has been a tightening of that. Now, is that the path towards a minimal spread that would be tolerable in order to actually share the risks? I think there is more to be had in terms of uh, uh, restructuring of the banking system at large, uh, completion of the banking union. Um, as probably uh, Mr. Enria mentioned this morning, completing the cleaning up of the non-performing loans and the proper assessment of the risk that they constitute on the balance sheet of banks. So a lot of homework needs to be done before we can actually move to that uh, um, risk sharing that you that you refer to, and that would be ideal if the conditions were satisfied. But I think we need to work on the conditions and the practicalities of it in order to make sure that we can move in that direction. Thank you. Now, Ernest Urtason from Greens. Yeah, thank you, Madame uh, Lagarde. Uh, well, with your candidacy, we have the, avoided the worst, which would have been to put the, those who, pract who practice monetary uh, populism at the head of the ECB, putting therefore at risk the future of the single currency. Uh, I think with the scenario, economic uh, scenario that we have, the toolkit needs to be used, as has been proven successful in the past, and I uh, welcome the commitments that you have expressed here this morning today. I have very one concrete question that touches on the side effects of those policies that of course need also to be addressed. You briefly mentioned that in your previous answer, which is the effects on the real estate. We, the, the housing prices have uh, increased much more than wages in the last years. It is a real problem in our, in our cities. And one, of course, cannot, um, cannot forget that, uh, of course, the policy of no rise in interest rates is absolutely necessary, but we need to compensate the impact in real state high income returns, which are massively at the moment attractive investment again. Everybody is aware of that. So my question regards what you mentioned before, uh, what to do with our mac macroprudential regulatory instruments. Uh, are you ready uh, to use the counter-cyclical capital buffers, variable risk weights, collateral requirements in order to compensate that side effect? I would like to know your ideas about that. Thank you. You know, on, on thank you very much. Uh, on, on that specific sector, I think that ma macroprudential uh, tools which are of recent uh, utilization around the world, have actually demonstrated the efficiency in relation to real estate. When you look at how it has uh, impacted, for instance, the price of real estate in Canada, in Australia, in various countries such as those where clearly there was a, a, a boom of prices on real estate, macroprudential tools, whether it's you know loan to value, loan to income, uh, micro macroprudential risks um, tools have been have been efficient and. They need to be used. Uh, in the present circumstances, I think it's indispensable that they be used. Thank you. Now, from But if I, if I can just yeah, add yeah, very quickly yeah. to that, I think there's also a, a supply issue, and where clearly uh, housing has to be in, in larger supply and may require that investments be facilitated or that public spending be engaged as well. Thank you. Now from ID, Antonio Rinaldi. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you very much, Madame Lagarde. There's a debate underway about uh, reviewing the mandate of the ECB. And you responded to a previous question from a, another colleague that you can only really pursue one primary objective, and that is price stability. 
avoiding inflation. But a lot of national institutions see work and employment as being the, f the fundamental aspect. As we were saying, maybe an employment target could be considered to be a primary objective. That's a question I really wanted to put to you because I feel it's important at this moment in time. A second question. Now, you, at this moment in time, I can you guarantee to 50 to Europe citizens your absolute independence? And I'm asking that as a simple European citizen. Because when a letter was uh, sent out in June 2013 to Le Monde, you signed up to a number of things that we really do not want to see if you are to become president of the European Central Bank. Back at that point, you expressed this to Nicolas Sarkozy. Well, the, we need somebody at the ECB that has to be extremely credible and extremely independent. Well, can you confirm that your actions in the ECB are going to be absolutely impeccably independent and neutral? Thank you so much for that question. Because I think on the issue of the independence of the central bank and the issue of the independence of the ECB president, I'm very, very pleased to confirm to you that, yes, I think it is intrinsically linked to the credibility and to the um, effectiveness of the central bank. And uh, while in political groupings, in cabinet, for instance, when you belong to a cabinet, if you operate solo and if you don't have the support of the team leader, you lack credibility. There's no question about that. In the case of the president of the ECB, I see that as a completely different situation. The law actually provides for that independence. The law actually instructs the leaders of the member states not to exercise any influence on the president of the ECB. And that is extremely important because the ECB is actually an institution that is serving the people of the euro area, not the leaders of the member states, and is accountable to the people of the euro area through you as representatives of the parliament. So this is something that, to me, is absolutely critical, and without which, I can assure you, I would not have even accepted to consider my candidacy. Thank you. And now we have uh, two earlier applicants for KHDI, so uh, my Vice Chair, Jan Kurtan. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, je parlerai en français. Je me réjouis, mais... I'll be speaking in French, and I'm very happy that you are the candidate for the head of the ECB, Madam, for at least three reasons over and beyond uh, credibility and independence that's been touched on by a number of, number of colleagues, but basically because you're the first woman to take this key role. And uh, there are five women that have spoken out of the 24 today. Um, so I think uh, their quality certainly overrides quantity. That's a joke, by the way. Anyway. I'm from Normandy, the north of France, and I think, as I think you are as well, Madam. The societal, technology, and environmental changes today are enormous, and that means we have to change our economic and monetary strategy. And in your answers, you've already stated your will to change the views of the ECB, or the, the perception of people have of the ECB and to better listen to young people and civil society. Um, and we also have to be very uh, listening very carefully to these same representatives. We want a monetary policy that stimulates uh, SMEs in Europe and that defends the interests of consumers. Um, consumers are key economic players at the heart of our economy. And for all of this to happen, Madam, well, how are we going to make the ECB more easy to understand? How can it be more practical and more open to people? One of the colleagues, for example, proposed an annual forum. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Vice. Thank you very much indeed, Vice Chair. Yes, I also would like to greet you as a fellow uh, uh, 
compatriot from Normandy and also a woman. Now, of course, it's important to include civil society, but that uh, isn't all we have to do. And I think that more specifically, if we want citizens to really feel closer to the Eurozone, then we have to be able to reach them through all channels and with all media uh, that makes sense to them. When I started at the IMF, I asked all of the teams to stop using abbreviations in their uh, language because that is a way to sort of estrange people and exclude them. And I also think we need to simplify uh, language here and stop using technocratic jargon. And that will mean that citizens are consumers, uh, ordinary people who are not experts in monetary policy, they will be able to better understand what the ECB is about and what the value of a currency is, uh, what means we have to act, and how regional sovereignty uh, plays a role here. So on all of these fronts, of course I want to be active, and I hope the Governing Council will also support me and be enthusiastic so that we can embark on better communication and different uh, uh, means to reach out to people, which I think is indispensable. Thank you. Okay, now the last speaker, a last question from Mr. Guzman, also Vice Chair of Econ. I will speak in Portuguese. Yep. Uh, sorry, I am not sure that uh, uh, English will be granted. Well, I can speak in English too. It's still 12.58. Respect the limit for, for interpreters. Uh, I agree with uh, many of my colleagues that have said that um, uh, unconventional monetary policy was crucial to uh, avoid a collapse of the euro area. Uh, and I also agree that the unconventional monetary policy has some risks. And uh, I would like to uh, draw from the experience of my own country because we had a, an austerity package and a, a troika intervention in Portugal that caused us not only to have a mega recession but also an in, the biggest increase in the public debt ratio in those years of fiscal adjustment. And we've been, uh, in the past few years, a new political majority has reversed some of the troika measures and not only did we have the biggest, the best growth years in Euro history, for our country, obviously, but we had the biggest decrease in the public debt ratio. So what I think should be uh, uh, an important debate is whether, uh, and a question that I would like to pose, uh, is whether you think that uh, dealing with the risks of unconventional monetary policy demands for uh, a, a policy mix that presently doesn't exist in the euro area, both at national and European level, or if you think that um, the stability of the euro area can be uh, achieved solely through uh, monetary policy combined with uh, um, austerity policies as we've been having. Well, thank you so much, and I would like to actually salute uh, the uh, the efforts of, of Portugal and the Portuguese uh, people in, in going through a, a period that was really, really difficult. And uh, it's, you know, it's not totally surprising uh, that the debt to GDP ratio was so much improved because as the country emerged out of this uh, program, it started picking up growth. And you know, certainly my colleagues at the IMF would consider that this has been a real success of the program, despite the fact that for a period of about three years it was very tough and many reforms were conducted. So in many ways, and that happens quite often in political uh, changes, the next team actually picks up uh, from where the previous team left it and generally uh, leverages on, on the efforts that were undertaken. But it was quite a remarkable uh, development that took place. I don't think that, you know, I disagree with you that any external shocks that would be suffered by the uh, euro area or any crisis that would be internally developed for whatever reason uh, would require a policy mix that would involve both the monetary tools but also the fiscal tool responses and a combination of reforms that either are taking place, although too modestly, and need to be, to be improved. I think the two have to go hand in hand 
And, you know, maybe that will be my conclusive remarks, and I don't want to ask and uh, impose upon you an additional two minutes. But clearly, cooperation uh, with the objective of strengthening the Eurozone, with a focus on the people in the Eurozone, should be the mantra going forward. And I, for myself, if I was confirmed as president of the ECB, I would certainly endeavor uh, to participate in that, and I would volunteer as much as I can in order to bring forces together uh, for the good of the people. Okay, thank you. So it means you don't want to... I give to. up my two minutes. That's great for sake of our health because we will uh, have a really 90 minutes uh, interruption before we reconvene at uh, 2.30 for discussion with the presidency, the Minister of Finance of Presidency of Finland. Let me now say, uh, or oh, actually uh, highly appreciate your presence here, your willingness to speak in such a detail for such a long period of time. We still cannot call you president of ECB, but maybe there is good luck that we will see you again in slightly different capacity. And once more, thank you very much. Thank you. You're much too kind. You are used to long meetings, you know, so. You know, I eat a lot of chocolate. Really? Chocolate is good. So yeah. next time we will bring it. You don't like it. <laughs>